If you would like a free newsletter on this or other subjects, just give us a call at Christian Answers. The phone number is area code 512-218-8022. That's 512-218-8022. Or you could email us at cdebater at aol.com. That's cdebater at aol.com. Thank you. And greetings to you each one in the name of the Lord Jesus. It's hard to believe that it has been six months already since we made our first video. The days and the months of our lives seem to just pass by so quickly and we never intended for so much time to, to lapse between the videos. But we hope that this video report will be informative and encouraging to you. Acts chapter 14 is one of my favorite chapters in the book of Acts. In this chapter, it records some of the Apostle Paul's journeys through towns such as Iconium and Lystra and Derbe, and then as he returns back through Antioch. In this chapter, it records Paul and Barnabas as they healed a man. The response of the people was that they tried to make gods out of Paul and Barnabas. They tried to worship Paul and Barnabas. They tried to even offer sacrifices to Paul and Barnabas. Starting in verse 15, if I could just read a few verses to you. Uh, Paul and Barnabas said this to the people. We are bringing you good news, telling you to turn from these worthless things to the living God who made heaven and earth and the sea and everything in them. In the past, he let all nations go their own way, yet he has not left himself without testimony. He has shown kindness by giving you rain from heaven and crops in their seasons. He provides you with plenty of food and fills your hearts with joy. But even these words, they had difficulty keeping the crowd from sacrificing to them. Then some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and won the crowd over, and they stoned the apostle Paul and dragged him outside the city, thinking that he was dead. But after the disciples had gathered around him, he got up, went back into the city, and the next day he and Barnabas left for Derby. They preached the good news in that city too and won a large number of disciples. They returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. And they said to them, We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them in each church and with prayer and fasting committed them to the Lord in whom they had put their trust. After going through Pisidia, they came into Pamphylia. And when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down to Atalia. From Atalia, they sailed back to Antioch where they had been committed to the grace of God for the work they had now completed. On arriving there, they gathered the church together and reported all that God had done through them and how he had opened up the door of faith to the Gentiles. And they stayed there a long time with the disciples. I know that is a, a bit of a long passage to read. And yet in this passage, we read three or four times where they use the word disciples. The emphasis seems to be on disciples, not merely converts, are those who have been saved but making disciples and this too is the emphasis that we are trying to have in our work upon the Marcoon people if you've been following our monthly reports you know about the recent increases in our fellowship we often have as many as 50 or 55 adults in our assemblies with maybe 20 or 25 children that come as well and we do not want just to have a congregation of converts we want to have a congregation of disciples. I just uh, heard this morning a message by Brother Andrew where he was talking about in his work, uh, the statistics he mentioned were to produce one convert, it took about 1% of his energy. To produce the same person into becoming a disciple, it took the rest of the remaining 99% of his energy. Now, I'm not sure if the statistics or the percentages that he quotes are correct, but I'm absolutely uh, convinced that the principle is correct. That converts are very easy to make. It's the disciples that are difficult. But it's the disciples that we are concerned in making and producing. Until just recently, we at Markham Fellowship have been meeting in a small open tin shed. 
and this has left us either to be drenched in the rain or hard boiled by the tropical sun. But just in the last couple of weeks, the church has uh, decided to purchase some large tents. And we have just, in the last week or two, put these tents up. And it has gone a long way in allowing us to have a more adequate place of worship. Though this, too, is a temporary setup. And you will see in this video our place of assembly both before and after we got our tents. And we have two or three more tents that will be coming very soon so that as our number uh, increases, we can add space simply by linking the tents together and this will serve us very well until the church can raise among themselves the finances for the construction of a more permanent meeting place. But the Marcoon Fellowship people, they're delightful saints really. We enjoy their company and their fellowship so much. Each week in our meetings, there is a, literally a barrage of testimonies and scripture readings and special songs and prayers. And our people bring these testimonies before the assembly as their offering to the Lord. And it is indeed a sacrifice of praise from our people to God. Each assembly is full of sharing because so much is happening in their lives through the week. The life of Jesus has given us life as individuals and so therefore there is life in our fellowship. And the one thing that I'm so encouraged to see among our people is their, com is their commitment to prayer. Our brethren have often put us to shame in their desire to pray. And our women especially have put us to shame. Many times our women have had times of prayer that we men didn't even know about until after the fact. And these times of prayer have often turned into seasons of prayer as the night has become morning. Uh, more than just one or two times have the women prayed uh, throughout the entire night. And there's no question that God is moving mightily among us right now. But that means that we need your prayers more than ever. Because we know that our enemy is already moving to oppose us, to hinder us, and if possible to destroy us. If not to destroy us, then to destroy our witness in this place. Though we are not overly concerned about Satan's onslaught, neither are we unaware of his schemes or of his devices or of his plans. We just pray that by God's grace we can continue on in the months and years to come even as we have begun in these first uh, eight or nine months since we've been here. And some of our recent reports too, I've mentioned uh, the, our desire to purchase some land in the Marcoon area. And we're making progress in this and we should have the land in our possession in another month or so. But I would ask you to make this too a matter of prayer as we are finding, uh, as we go through the different procedures, uh, a lot of different hindrances and people that will try to, to uh, hinder us from uh, acquiring this land. And also, too, I go to one, uh, what they call a kiosk, or one of the leaders uh, of the city council or whatever, and ask them what the uh, laws are concerning land ownership. And he will tell me one thing, and I go to another man, and he tells me another thing, and go to another man, and he tells me another thing. And it has proven no small obstacle just in finding out what the laws are concerning land ownership so that we can fulfill our legal obligations. But we are praying that very soon we, we will have this land, uh, then we can transfer our tents where we're now meeting onto this land. And we're praying too that very soon Tommy and I will be able to begin the construction of our own house on this land. As I just mentioned, we have plans for a more permanent place of worship. We have plans for a small, uh, modest Bible school facility, uh, eventually a, a medical clinic and a print shop. All of these are areas that we are hoping to extend our work uh, within the next year or so. Already the Lord is answering our prayer for laborers, and I believe that God will supply the finances as well, the resources to carry on the plans of, that we have made. As my friend Pastor John Armstrong in Wheaton has said in one of his tape messages that I received, he said God finances what he is in, and I believe that is absolutely true. Now for some of the plans that we have for the remainder of the year, as I have just mentioned, we are fully expecting more laborers to join us. We are expecting three permanent missionaries to join us before the end of this year. The Larry Overton family, we expect them to join us in August. Carol Jones, uh, a sister from up in Toronto from the, the Jarvis Street Baptist Church, she will join us in September, and the John Wiley family in December. Uh, we also have my friend Ernest Herndon from Mississippi coming during May. Three college students during uh, June and July from the Highland Baptist Church in Waco, Texas. And my mom will be here too during September. So you can see that we have a full schedule. 
from now until the end of our lives, I think. But the Lord is answering our prayers for laborers. And these people, though, a lot of them are, are just visitors for a month or two months. Uh, they are visitors, and yet their desire is to come and to aid us in the work that we are doing for the Lord in this place. As for the actual work, uh, some of the plans, uh, one of the more major plans that we have for the next few months is some extensive patrol work for the months of May, June, and July. Uh, even uh, next week, I will be leaving on a major contact patrol to a new area about 350 miles from Wewak. This is a new area, a place that we just found out about just even in this week. And uh, some of the people from this area, it's a very remote area up in the, up in the mountains. Uh, they have walked two and three days to get to some little mission uh, settlement and have been inquiring about the gospel and asking for someone to come into them with the gospel. So we're very excited about making this uh, new contact with this, these people. Uh, we'll fly into a bush airstrip, walk a few days into the mountains, and try to make contacts with a few different villages. Uh, then we will hopefully in the future, we'll go back into these villages and, and we would pray that uh, a church or two or three churches could be established in this area. But I'll share more about this in my next report and in the next video report. As our fellowship here continues to grow, uh, one of the things that we're trying to do is to get a leadership training class started for our men. This will be the, the first step towards uh, the realizing of our goals for having national pastors and for the first national missionaries. I think in my last newsletter I mentioned that this was one of the main uh, goals that I personally have for our fellowship is that within the next two years we can have national pastors. Within the next three years we can have a national missionary sent out to another part of Papua New Guinea, completely overseen and financed by our... I wanted to say just a few words about Tommy and the baby. As most of you are probably aware, we are expecting our second child in July. Tommy's pregnancy is going very well. However, we will be going to the town of Leigh for delivery because of some possible complications. Tommy has a fairly rare blood type, and my blood type is her opposite. So we are concerned about what is called the RH factor. I don't know all that much about the RH factor, but we have been advised by some of uh, the doctors that we've consulted that we should go to the town of Lay as the facilities would be much better. And they could handle any complication that may arise. Tommy and a single girl from Waco, Texas will be going to Lay in early July, and I will be following shortly after that. The due date for the child is July 23rd. So we are praying uh, that all will go well, that we'll have a healthy child, and we're praying for a little girl this time. Though we'll be perfectly happy with whatever the Lord's choice would be. And we ask, though, that you too would pray that everything would go well, that Tommy and the baby would be uh, healthy. In closing my comments on this part of the video, I just wanted to encourage you in our encouragement. The Lord is helping us to accomplish so much and the future is full of promised progress for our labors. In this video, some of the things that you will be seeing will be scenes from the Marcoon Fellowship worship. You will see some of our people clearing the land that we're hoping to get, clearing the land in the old-fashioned way with bush knives and what they call seraphs. And then there will be some shots of our own family, and, and uh, I'm not even sure what else we'll, we'll put on. We'll, pro we'll try to get some other interesting shots that you will enjoy. We just invite you to sit back and watch and rejoice with us in all that God is doing here. You know, we have a dream of seeing Papua New Guinea completely evangelized by the year 2000. And we believe that the Lord has given us a vision and a strategy to accomplish this goal. And I was just thinking about this just the other day. We only have 15 years more before the year 2000. And I know that probably sounds like a, lo a long time. And yet, it's been almost eight years since I first came to Papua New Guinea. And those eight years have literally flown. It seems just like months ago that I first arrived in Papua New Guinea. And the time goes by so quickly. Fifteen years is not all that long. And so I propose to you that we each one could make a new commitment to the Lord and to the unreached peoples of Papua New Guinea. That in the next fifteen years, we will give this work our most concerted effort. And we will give this work the benefit of our, of our most fervent prayers. 
So by the year 2000, we can look back over the preceding 20 years or 15 years. And like Paul, we can say that there's no longer any place for us in these parts. No place in all of Papua New Guinea where the name of Jesus has not gone. No place in all of Papua New Guinea in the interior parts, on the coast, or wherever where the, a meaningful presentation of the gospel has not been made. And if Papua New Guinea is evangelized in our generation, fantastic. That is the very thing that we live to see and that we work to see accomplished. Or on the other hand, if our efforts are only the seed that will bring forth a future harvest, that too, that's okay. Because as one brother has said in a message that I heard, the kingdom is going to keep on coming. In one sense, the kingdom is already here. The church is here. The church is a part of the kingdom. And yet, as far as Papua New Guinea is concerned, there are many, many places where the name of Christ has not been named. Many, many places where there are no missionaries, where there is no church, where there is no Christian witness. And so, as our brother has said, the kingdom is going to keep on coming. The kingdom needs to keep on going until it goes and saturates all of Papua New Guinea uh, with the gospel. What a mercy that we have had a part to play and that we have a continuing part to play in this work in Papua New Guinea. What a joy that God has used us in His plan, a plan that was conceived before the foundations of the earth were ever even laid into place. May we be faithful to His plan. May we be faithful to our God. Our desire is that it may be said of you and us, as it was once said of the apostles before in their work, that they were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. This is our prayer for you. We will be making videos. I promise that I will not allow six months to pass before the next video comes to you. But the Lord be with you. The grace and peace of the Lord Jesus be with you, each one. I thought for this video, perhaps we would just show you a little bit about Marcoon. Uh, this is uh, called Marcoon, Marcoon Village Settlement, just on the outside of Wewak. This is where the new church has started. This afternoon we're going to have worship together, and then we're going to have a, a fellowship meal. So I thought maybe we'd just show you a little bit around Marcoon Village Settlement, and then the Marcoon Fellowship itself.
Alright. Now you only say come come up to this now. Thank you, Ramadi Khan. Give me a hand on what's that? So you play here, you're bring you right now.
God has been marmaring long you me. I me believe long this this fella. God has has long passing long. Like him through all man.
Are you seeing after time off? <laughs>
belakang sama Fani tuh. Kamu kerekat.
Lord Satan, and I will walk along it. And me, Lord, I give him big glory to us, Lord Satan. I'll say, be like now, for God, Lord Jesus, and some will walk along it. I'll say, head talk, Lord, just for talk. And by some of us, say, Jesus Christ, and me help him, Lord, you me. I mean, like, read him just for a little top right, Lord, number one, John, chapter one, uh, chapter two, line one, equal two. And this will end by talk out, Lord. Jesus Christ, and me help him, Lord, you mean, and you mean by talk out, Lord, this will end our morning. Number one, John, chapter two, line one, equal two. All lick lick picking any belong me. Me write them this full of talk, Lord Yubala. By Yubala, he no can make him sin. Now suppose one fellow man, he make him sin. You mean he got help him, belong you mean. Let me stop one time, Papa. And this full of straight fellow man, Jesus Christ. Am yet, he make him walk, belong take away sin, below you mean. Now am, he no make him this full of walk, belong help him, you mean that's all, no God. We don't help him all get him out. All right, it's April 14th. We just finished our worship service for the morning. We just wanted to gather as a church and sing one song for you in pigeon. But we'll do it in English first and then in pigeon. Oh, about this uh, patrol that I'm going to be going on in another week or so. Uh, just recently, in the last week, some people, and Tommy can zoom in on the map here and I'll show you, some people from this area, right in the central mountain range, uh, for some reason have become curious about the gospel. I guess they've heard about Jesus, they've heard about the gospel, maybe some people uh, from their place had gone uh, closer. This here is the Seeping River. Wewak is here in the north. This is about 350 miles from Wewek. And evidently some people from this area had uh, heard about the gospel from some of their uh, own people that had gone maybe to the Seabic River, heard about Jesus, came back, and now they have a curiosity uh, about Jesus himself. And so they have walked, in some cases, a full week to get to this place here called Sumwari. And the, there are some missionaries here, or if not missionaries, it's a mission station for the South Sea Evangelical uh, Mission. I have a meeting tomorrow morning with a missionary from this mission. Hopefully we can coordinate our efforts and can make an inreach into this area here. These are some of the largest mountains in Papua New Guinea, 10, 12, uh, in some cases 13 or 14,000 feet high. Uh, what, right now what we're proposing to do is to fly from Wewak to this little bush airstrip on the side of a mountain in Sisamen. And uh, from there we'll get some carriers. Uh, I don't know how far we'll, even we'll have to walk. Probably three, four, possibly even five days. Uh, it's going to be uh, really in search of, of this tribe or this tribes or villages that are curious about the gospel. We'll be walking north, crossing a few rivers, uh, right, it's right on the border of three different provinces, the Southern Highlands, the East Civic, the West Civic, and even the, the Western Province. So it's right in the heart of the country. And so we're really looking forward to this patrol. By the time you get this tape, at least you day springers, uh, you'll get the tape and I'll probably be out there. So as you're watching this, we would appreciate your prayers. We would especially appreciate your prayers on behalf of these people 
I don't even know the tribe name of the people. I don't know how many people we're talking about. I just know that the people are curious and they want to know about Jesus. They want to know about the gospel. Um, the Sepik River is the, one of the main uh, highways uh, of getting around within the East and West Sepik province. It's the largest river by far in Papua New Guinea. Uh, obviously, there are absolutely no roads in this part of the country. Zero roads. There are a couple of roads from Wewak where you can drive to the Sepik River at certain points, but then you have to get a motorized canoe and uh, go either uh, up or downstream and then maybe connect with another river and, and we have plans for, for doing this. One of the men in our church, uh, he's from an area near Timbunke, uh, not, not Timbuktu, Timbunke. And we'll drive to Timbunke and maybe go an hour or two on a canoe and he has a village there. That's where he's from. And hopefully uh, we're planning, even in June, some good news meetings uh, in that area. We'll use some slides. We'll take a generator in, have slides, and present the gospel in that way. That's one area. Uh, that we want to go to. This area here I just told you about is another area. This uh, uh, another area called Sisano up in the w West Sepik is another area where uh, doors seem to be opening for us. And so as far as our outreach is concerned, it just seems that the doors are opening just almost in every province adjoining the East uh, Sepik. So we're very encouraged and we're just uh, hoping that Larry Overton and John Wiley and, and some of these other workers, Carol Jones, uh, my mom, Ernest Herndon, right now is in Moresby. We'll, we'll see him in a couple of days. We just look forward to these workers getting here so that we can coordinate our efforts. Uh, we can leave one missionary here in town to help coordinate the activities of the local church here, and then let's start reaching out into these uttermost parts uh, with the gospel. This is our desire. This is our plan. So pray for us and send us workers. Uh, maybe even uh, Brother Jackson or Ben or... Or Johnny, one of you guys can come on over. If you won't come, then send some Dayspring evangelist fellows to us. Send us David Moody. Uh, but I have to warn Brother Moody, when he comes over here, he'll probably want to stay. And so that would hurt me maybe more than help me because he's doing such a good job for us back in the States. And we just really appreciate, uh, David, all of the work that you're doing for us. You know, I know that it's not you know, an easy job that you do, and maybe... Uh, you don't get the appreciation that you deserve for the work that you do for us, but we do appreciate it. I mean, we couldn't do what we do without your help from that end. Uh, getting our newsletters out, they're A1, super quality, uh, reproducing the videos and, and sending, sending them out to the people that inquire about them. All of these things, you know, I know that you, uh, you're you very efficient and you get it out to the people, and we appreciate that because it's so important that you do that. Uh, what are some things that I can share? You know, our support situation has just been excellent. It seems like every month when I, I get the amount from you, we get the money immediately. Then about two weeks later, uh, I get the, the, the forms or the sheets that tell me who has contributed what for the month. And it seems like every month we have new people, people that I have never even heard of, people in some cases from churches that we travel to on furlough, in other cases, people in churches that we don't even know who they are or how they heard about us. And so uh, we're very encouraged that the Lord is even now uh, raising up more and more support for us. I think maybe we've lost some support too, but uh, it's very stable. We, we, I guess, rarely, if ever, have ever dropped below the 2,000 mark. And, uh, and with the exchange rate too the way it is, we're just in very good shape financially. Just uh, last night had a men's business meeting uh, with eight or ten of our men from our local fellowship here at Marcoon. And uh, some of the things that we discussed, maybe you'd be interested in. Uh, you know, our, our fellowship is growing more and more. We're up to maybe 50 people, 55 people sometimes. And we have an awful large uh, youth group. Uh, kids between, you know, everywhere from Joshua's age all the way up to 10 or 12 or 14 years of age. So it looks like very soon, in the next month or so, we're going to begin having uh, Sunday school for these children, uh, maybe uh, some uh, teaching on the gospel through maybe puppets or slides or pictures or just trying in different ways to put Bible studies uh, on their own level. Uh, some other questions that some of our men have had, uh, they've had questions concerning the Lord's Supper, they've had questions concerning baptism, uh, questions concerning the 
the offerings and how, maybe how would be some good ways of, of uh, giving offerings. Uh, we have some of our people that are from an Assembly of God background, and every time we fellowship, I mean every single meeting, morning and night on Sundays and Wednesday nights, even special meetings, they pass the plate. And it's just a, a tradition that some of the people have picked up from before when they were at the Assembly of God. And, uh, you know, some of our people, some of our, uh, what we call our lap lapoon mamas, some of the old widowed ladies, uh, sometimes they don't have anything to give, and the way that we've been doing it sometimes causes them to have shame or they're embarrassed because they don't have much. So we're trying to restructure that. And, and also some people have been saved within our fellowship. God has, has saved them through the gospel that has been preached, and yet we, we haven't had any baptisms. And, uh, you know, coming from my background, you know, when they're saved, I believe in the same hour of the night, uh, they need to be baptized. And the reason I haven't pressed for this sooner is that I'm trying very much. There's two of our men that are pretty well, or will become the pastors of this church. And I've been trying to go very slowly and let them take charge, let them take the lead. Uh, but in these two or three areas, uh, nothing has been done over the months. And so I'm beginning in a tactful way, in, in, a, in a slow a way to begin to teach on some of these areas. Uh, we're also going to have a, a gospel meeting out at Markham. There's an awful lot of people right there at Markham that, that are unsaved. They come from Catholic tradition, uh, but they're dead. They're just spiritually dead. They're still involved in, in the Sanguma practices, the witchcraft, and the, the whole thing. So there, we just have an awful lot planned uh, for this year and for the years to come. Here's a carving that I got from uh, the village of, uh, where was that? Warembi. Warembi, the first village that I went to on the Civic River. And this is one of the carvings that I picked up. This is my disciple. He's about uh, four and a half feet tall, solid wood. And uh, I don't think that there's any uh, spiritual significance to this particular carving, but I would say that every carving that we brought back, or that I brought back, we anointed with oil, laid hands on it, cast out any evil spirits or any demonic influence. Uh, because a lot of these carvings, uh, who knows, even some of this marking uh, on this carving could have, who knows, what kind of spiritual significance when the, you know, the person that carved it. So that's just one of the, one of the things that I have. Uh, but I guess, you know, I would close the, this part of the video and we'll go ahead and get it to you. We, we tried to fill up the video as much as possible with things that would be of interest. Uh, but we're finding it difficult to fill up a complete two hours. And also, we, we know two hours is an awfully long time to sit and just watch, too. But we just appreciate you so much, you day springers. And we're looking forward. I was just telling the men last night that some of our elders are going to be coming. And uh, they're just so excited about that. And, and you're, you're committed. You're committed. Before uh, 19, the middle of 1987, when tentatively we'll, we'll go on, on our uh, furlough, you're committed to one or two. Check out our websites, BibleQuery.org. This site answers 7,700 Bible questions. HistoryCart.com. This site reveals early church history and doctrine proving Roman Catholicism is not historically or doctrinally viable. MuslimHope.com. This site is a classic refutation of Islam, a counterfeit religion created by Muhammad. Free newsletters are also available. 